Hi everybody, Carla here, coming to you on this cold wintry day in the southeastern United States. Thank you so much for joining me here at Carla Reads the Classics. I appreciate it each and every time you listen. So where are you listening from today? Say hi, let me know where you're listening from. Costs you nothing. Let me give a special hello to all my new listeners in Germany and Russia, Canada, Australia, the UK, India, and in Switzerland, and of course here in the United States. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time today listening to Carla Reads the Classics. Now today I have for you a classic piece from the Mexican classics called Pedro Peramo, written by Juan Rufo in 1955. I'm reading the translation by Margaret Sayers. Peden. Now, Pedro Peramo is the story of Juan Preciado, who, after his mother dies, he tries to keep a promise he made to her to find his father. He travels to a town called Comala, which he finds to be a literal ghost town. Now, the Washington Post calls this story a strange brooding novel with great immediacy, power, and beauty. So please relax and let's enjoy this book together. Without further ado, I give you Pedro Peramo by Juan Rufo. Part one. I came to Comala because I had been told that my father, a man named Pedro Peramo, lived there. It was my mother who told me, and I had promised her that after she died, I would go and see him. I squeezed her hand as a sign that I would do it. She was near death and I would have promised her anything. Don't fail to go see him, she had insisted. Some call him one thing, some another. I'm sure he will want to know you. At the time, all I could do was tell her I would do what she asked. And from promising so often, I kept repeating the promise even after I had pulled my hands free of her death grip. She earlier told me, don't ask him for anything, just what's ours, what he should have given me but never did. Make him pay, son, for all the years he put us out of his mind. I will, mother. I never meant to keep my promise, but before I knew it, my head began to swim with dreams and my imagination took flight. Little by little, I began to build a world around a hope centered on a man called Pedro Peramo the man who had been my mother's husband. That's why I had come to Comala. It was during the dog days, the season when the August wind blows hot, venomous with the rotten stench of saponaria blossoms. The road fell and rose. It rises or falls, depending on whether you're coming or going. If you are leaving, it's uphill. But as you arrive, it's downhill. What did you say the town down there is called? Comala, senor. You're sure that's Comala? I'm sure, senor. It's a sorry looking place. What happened to it? It's the times, senor. I had expected to see the town of my mother's memories, of her nostalgia, nostalgia laced with sighs. She had lived her lifetime sighing about Comala, about going back, but she never had. Now I had come in her place. I was seeing things through her eyes as she had seen them. She had given me her eyes to see. Just as you pass the gate of Los Colimotes, there's a beautiful view of a green plain tinged with the yellow of ripe corn. From there, you can see Comala turning the earth white and lighting it at night. Her voice was secret, muffled, as if she were talking to herself. Mother. And why are you going to Comala, if you don't mind my asking? I heard the man say. I've come to see my father, I replied. Mm, he said, and again, silence. We were making our way down the hill to the clip-clop of the burros' hooves. Their sleepy eyes were bulging from the August heat. You're going to get some welcome. Again, I heard the voice of the man walking at my side. They'll be happy to see someone after all the years no one's come this way. After a while, he added, whoever you are, they'll be glad to see you. In the shimmering sunlight, the plain was transparent, was like a transparent lake dissolving in mists that veiled a gray horizon. Farther in the distance, a range of mountains and farther still, faint remoteness. 
And what does your father look like, if you don't mind my asking? I never knew him, I told the man. I only know his name is Pedro Peramo. Um, that's so. Yes, at least that was the name I was told. Yet again, I heard the burl driver's mm. I had run into him at the crosswords called Los Encuentros. I had been waiting there, and finally this man had appeared. Where are you going? I asked. Down that way, senor. Do you know a place called Comala? That's the very way I'm going. So I followed him. I walked along behind, trying to keep up with him until he seemed to remember I was following and slowed down a little. After that, we walked side by side, so close our shoulders were nearly touching. Pedro Peramos, my father too, he said. A flock of crows swept across the empty sky, shrilling, caw, caw, caw. Up and downhill we went, but always descending. We had left the hot wind behind and were sinking into pure airless heat. The stillness seemed to be waiting for something. It's hot here, I said. You might say, but this is nothing, my companion replied. Try to take it easy. You'll feel it even more when we get to Comala. That town sits on the coals of the earth at the very mouth of hell. They say that when people from there die and go to hell, they come back for a blanket. Do you know Pedro Peramo? I asked. I felt I could ask because I had seen a glimmer of goodwill in his eyes. Who is he? I pressed him. Living bile was his reply. And he lowered his stick against the burrows for no reason at all, because they had been far ahead of us, guided by the descending trail. The picture of my mother I was carrying in my pocket felt hot against my heart, as if she herself were sweating. It was an old photograph worn around the edges, but it was the only one I, I had of her. I had found it in the kitchen safe, inside a clay pot filled with herbs, dried lemon balm, castilla blossom, blossoms, sprigs of rue. I had kept it with me ever since. It was all I had. My mother always hated having her picture taken. She said photographs were a tool of witchcraft. And they may have been so, but hers was riddled with pinpricks, and at the location of the heart there was a hole you could stick your middle finger through. I had brought the photograph with me, thinking it might help my father recognize who I was. Take a look, the burrow driver said, stopping. You see that rounded hill that looks like a hog bladder? Well, the media luna lies right behind there. Now turn that way. You see that brow of that hill? Look hard. And now back this way. You see that ridge? The one so far you can't hardly see it? Well, all that's the media luna. From end to end, like they say, as far as the eye can see. He owns every bit of that land. We're Pedro Peramos' sons, all right, but for all that, our mothers brought us into the world on straw mats, and the real joke of it is that he's the one carried us to be baptized. That's how it was with you, wasn't it? I don't remember. The hell you say? What did you say? I said, we're getting there. We're getting there, senor. Yes, I, I see it now. What could it have been? There was a Coraceraminos, senor, a roadrunner. That's what that's what they call those birds around here. No, no, I meant I wonder what could have happened to the town. It, it looks so deserted, abandoned, really. In fact, it looks like no one lives here at all. It doesn't just look like no one lives here. No one does live here. And Pedro Peramo? Pedro Peramo died years ago. It was the hour of the day when in every little village children come out to play in the streets, filling the afternoon with their cries, the time when dark walls still reflect pale yellow sunlight. At least that was what I had seen in Sayula just yesterday at this hour. I, I'd seen the still air shadowed, shattered by the flight of doves flapping their wings as if pulling themselves free of the day. They swooped and plummeted above the tile rooftops while the children's screams whirled and seemed to turn blue into the dusk sky. 
Now, here I was in this hushed town. I could hear my footsteps on the cobbled paving stones, hollow footsteps echoing against walls stained red by the setting sun. This was the hour I found myself walking down the main street. Nothing but abandoned houses, their empty doorways overgrown with weeds. What had the stranger told me they were called? La Gobernadora, Signor, Cresote Bush. A plague that takes over a person's house the minute he leaves, you'll see. As I passed a street corner, I saw a woman wrapped in her rebozo. She disappeared as if she had never existed. I started forward again, peering into the doorless houses. Again, the woman in the rebozo crossed in front of me. Evening, she said. I looked after her. I shouted, where will I find Doña Eduviges? She pointed. There, the house beside the bridge. I took note that her voice had human overtones, that her mouth was filled with teeth and a tongue that worked as she spoke, and that her eyes were the eyes of people who inhabit the earth. But now it was dark. She turned to call good night, and though there were no children playing, no doves, no blue-shadowed roof tiles, I felt that the town was alive, and that if I heard only silence, it was because I was not yet accustomed to silence, maybe because my head was still filled with sounds and voices. Yes, voices, and here, where the air was so rare, I heard them even stronger. They lay heavy inside me. I remembered what my mother had said. You will hear me better there. I will be closer to you. You will hear the voice of my memory stronger than the voice of my death. That is, if death ever had a voice. Mother, so alive. How I wished she were, she were here so I could say, you were mistaken about the house. You told me the wrong place. You sent me south of nowhere to an abandoned village looking for someone who's no longer alive. I found the house by the bridge by following the sound of the river. I lifted my hand to knock, but there was nothing there. My hand met only empty space, as if the wind had blown open the door. A woman stood there. She said, come in, and I went in. So I stayed in Komala. The man with the burros had gone on his way. Before leaving, he'd said, I still have a way to go, yonder where you see that band of hills. My house is there. If you want to come, you will be welcome. For now, if you want to stay here, then stay. You got nothing to lose by taking a look around, and you may find someone who's still among the living. I stayed. That was why I had come. Where can I find lodging? I called, almost shouting now. Look up Doña Eduviges. Is she still alive? Tell her I sent you. And what's your name? Abundio, he called back. But he was too far for me to hear his last name. I am Eduviges Dayada. Come in. It was as if she had been waiting for me. Everything was ready, she said, motioning for me to follow her through a long series of dark, seemingly empty rooms, but no. As soon as my eyes grew used to the darkness and the thin thread of light following us, I saw shadows looming on either side and sensed that we were walking down a narrow passageway open between bulky shapes. What do you have here? I asked. Odds and ends, she said. My house is chock full of other people's things. As people went away, they chose my house to store their belongings, but not one of them has ever come back to claim them. The room I kept for you is here at the back. I keep it cleaned out in case anyone comes. So, you're her son? Whose son? I asked. Dolorita's boy. Yes, but how did you know? She told me you would be coming today. In fact, that you would be coming today. Who told you? My mother? Yes, your mother. I did not know what to think, but Eduviges left me no time for thinking. This is your room, she said. The room had no doors except for the one we had entered. The, she lighted the candle and I could see the room was completely empty. There's no place to sleep, I said. Don't worry about that. You must be tired from your journey and weariness makes a good mattress. I'll fix up a bed for you first thing in the morning. You can't expect me to have things ready on the spur of the moment. A person needs some warning, and I didn't get a word from your mother until just now. My mother? I said. My, my mother is dead. 
So that was why her voice sounded so weak, like it had to travel a long distance to get here. Now I understand. And when did she die? A week ago. Poor woman. She must have thought I'd forsaken her. We made each other a promise we died together, that we would go hand in hand to lend each other courage on our last journey in case we had need for something or ran into trouble. We were the best of friends. Didn't she ever talk about me? No, never. That's strange. Of course, we were just girls then. She was barely married, but we loved each other very much. Your mother was so pretty, so, well, sweet, that it made a person happy to love her. You wanted to love her. So she got a head start on me, eh? Well, you can be sure I'll catch up with her. No one knows better than I do how far heaven is, but I know also all the shortcuts. The secret is to die, God willing, when you want to, and not when he proposes, or else to force him to take you before your time. For forgive me for going on like this, talking to you as if we were old friends, but I, I do it because you're like my own son. Yes, I said it a thousand times. Dolores's boy should have been my son. I'll tell you why sometime. All I want to say now is that I'll catch up with your mother along one of these roads to eternity. I wondered if she were crazy, but by now I wasn't thinking at all. I felt I was in a far away world and let myself be pulled along by the current. My body, which felt weaker and weaker, surrendered completely. It had slipped its ties and anyone who wanted could have wrung me out like a rag. I'm tired, I said. Come eat something before you sleep. A bite. Anything there, anything there is. I will. I, I will come later. Water dripping from the roof tiles was forming a hole in the sand of the patio. Plink, plink, and then another plink as drops struck a bobbing, dancing laurel leaf caught in a crack between the adobe bricks. The storm had passed. Now an intermittent breeze shook the branches of the pomegranate tree, losing showers of heavy rain spattering the ground with gleaming drops that dulled as they sank into the earth. The hens, still huddled on their roost, suddenly flapped their wings and strutted out to the patio, heads bobbing, pecking worms unearthed by the rain. As the clouds retreated, the sun flashed on the rocks, spread an iridescent sheen, sucked water from the soil, shone on the sparkling leaves stirred by the breeze. What's taking you so long in the privy, son? Nothing, Mama. If you stay in there much longer, a snake will come and bite you. Yes, Mama. I was thinking of you, Susanna, of the green hills, of when we used to fly kites in the windy season. We could hear the sounds of the life from the town below. We were high above on the hill, playing out string to the wind. Help me, Susanna. And soft hands would tighten on mine. Let out more string. The wind made us laugh. Our eyes followed the string running through our fingers after the wind until, with a faint pop, it broke as if it had been snapped by the wings of a bird. And high overhead, the paper bird would tumble and somersault, trailing its rag tail until it disappeared into the green earth. Your lips were moist as if kissed by the dew. I told you, son, come out of the privy now. Yes, Mama, I'm coming. I was thinking of you, of the times you were there looking at me with your aquamarine eyes. He looked up and saw his mother in the doorway. What's taking you so long? What are you doing in there? I'm thinking. Can't you do it somewhere else? It's not good for you to stay in the privy so long. Besides, you should be doing something. Why don't you go help your grandmother shell corn? I'm going, Mama. I'm going. Grandmother, I've come to help you shell corn. We're through with that, but we still have to grind the chocolate. Where have you been? We were looking for you all during the storm. I was in the back patio. And what were you doing? Praying? No, grandmother, I was just watching it rain. His grandmother looked at him with those yellow gray eyes that seemed to see right through a person. Run, clean the mill then. Hundreds of meters above the clouds, far, far above everything. You are hiding, Susanna, hiding in God's immensity behind his divine providence where I cannot touch you or see you and where my words cannot reach you. Grandmother, the mill's no good. The grinder's broken. 
That Michaela must have run corn through it. I can't break her of that habit, but it's too late now. Why don't we buy a new one? This one's so old it isn't any good anyway. That's the Lord's truth, but with all the money we spent to bury your grandfather and the tithes we've paid to the church, we don't have anything left. Oh, well, we'll, we'll do something else and, and buy a new one. Why don't you run Sidonia Inez Valpando and ask her to carry us on her books until October? We'll pay her at harvest time. All right, grandmother. And while you're at it, to kill two birds with one stone, ask her to lend us a sifter and some clippers. The way those weeds are growing, we'll soon have them coming out our ears. If I had my big house with all my stock pens, I wouldn't be complaining. But your grandfather took care of that when we moved here. Well, it must be God's will. Things seldom work out the way you want. Tell Doña Inez that after harvest time, we'll pay her everything we owe her. Yes, grandmother. Hummingbirds. It was the season. He heard the whirring of their wings and blossom-heavy jasmine. He stopped by the shelf where the pictures of the Sacred Heart stood and found 24 centavos. He left the four single coins and took the viente. He was leaving. His mother stopped him. Where are you going? Down to Doña Inez Valapando's to buy a new mill. Ours broke. Ask her to give you a meter of black taffeta like this. And she handed him a piece and to put it on our account. All right, Mama. On the way back, buy me some aspirin. You'll find some money in the flower pot in the hall. He found a peso. He left the viente and took the larger coin. Now I have enough money for anything that comes along, he thought. Pedro, people called to him. Hey, Pedro. But he did not hear. He was far, far away. During the night, it began to rain again. For a long time, he lay listening to the gurgling of the water. Then he must have slept because when he awoke, he heard only a quiet drizzle. The window panes were misted over and raindrops were threading down like tears. I watched the trickles glinting in the lightning and the lightning flashes, and every breath I breathed, I sighed, and every thought I thought was of you, Susanna. The rain turned to wind. He heard the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the flesh. Amen. This was deeper in the house where women were telling the last of their beads. They got up from their prayers. They penned up the chickens. They bolted the door. They turned out the light. Now there was only the light of night and rain hissing like the murmur of crickets. Why didn't you come say your rosary? We were making a novena for your father. His mother was standing in the doorway, candle in hand. Her long cricket shadow stretched toward the ceiling. The roof beam, beams repeated it in fragments. I feel sad, he said. Then she turned away. She snuffed out the candle. As she closed the door, her sobs began. He could hear them for a long time, mixed with the sound of the rain. The church clock told the hours, hour after hour, hour after hour, as if time had been telescoped. Oh, yes, I was nearly your mother. She never told you anything about it? No, she only told me good things. I heard about you from the man with the train of burros, the man who led me here, the one named Abun Abundio. He's a good man, Abundio, so he still remembers me. I used to give him a little something for every traveler he sent to my house. It was a good deal for both of us. Now, sad to say, times have changed, and since the town has fallen on bad times, no one brings us any news. So, he told you to come see me. Yes, he, he said to look for you. I'm grateful to him for that. He was a good man, one you could trust. It was him that brought the mail, and he kept, he kept right on even after he went deaf. I remember the black day it happened. Everyone felt bad about it because we all liked him. He brought letters to us and, and took ours away. He always told us how things were going on on the other side of the world, and doubtless he told them how we were making out. He was a big talker. Well, not afterward. He stopped talking then. He said there wasn't much point in saying things he couldn't hear, things that evaporated in the air, things he couldn't get the taste of. It all happened when one of those big rockets we used to scare away water snakes went off too close to his head. 
From that day on, he never spoke, though he wasn't struck dumb. But one thing I tell you, it didn't make him any less a good person. The man I'm talking about heard fine. Then it couldn't, then it can't have been him. Besides, Abundio died. I'm sure he's dead. So you see, it couldn't have been him. I guess you're right. Well, well, getting back to your mother, as I was telling you, as I listened to her drone on, I studied the woman before me. I thought she must have gone through some bad times. Her face was transparent as if the blood had drained from it and her hands were all shriveled, nothing but wrinkled claws. Her eyes were sunk out of sight. She was wearing an old-fashioned white dress with rows of ruffles, and around her neck, strung on a cord, she wore a medal of the Maria Santissima del Lufugio with the words, Refuge of Sinners. This man I'm telling you about broke horses over at the Media Luna Ranch. He said his name was Inocencio Osorio. Everyone knew him, though, by his nickname, Cucklebur. He could stick to a horse like a burr to a blanket. My compadre Pedro used to say that the man was born to break colts. The fact is, though, that he had another calling, conjuring. He conjured up dreams. That was who he really was, and he put it over on your mother, like he did so many others, including me. Once, when I was feeling bad, he showed up and said, I've come to give you a treatment so as you feel better. And what that meant was that he would start out kneading and rubbing you. First, your fingertips, then he'd stroke your hands, then your arms. First thing you know, he'd be working on your legs, rubbing hard, and soon you'd be feeling warm all over. And all the time he was rubbing and stroking, he'd be telling you your fortune. He would fall into a trance and roll his eyes and conjure the curse with spittle flying everywhere. You'd have thought he was a gypsy. Sometimes he would end up stark naked. He said he wanted it that way. And sometimes what he said came true. He shot at so many targets that once in a while he was bound to hit one. So what happened was that when your mother went to see this Osorio, he told her that she shouldn't lie with the man that night because the moon was wrong. Dolores came and told me everything in a quandary about what to do. She said there was no two ways about it. She couldn't go to bed with Pedro Paramo that night, her wedding night. And there I was trying to convince her that she shouldn't put any stock in that Osorio. He was nothing but a swindler and a liar. I can't, she told me. You go for me. He'll never catch on. Of course, I was a lot younger than she was and not quite as dark skinned. But you can't tell that in the dark. It'll never work, Dolores. You have to go. Do this one favor and I'll pay you back a hundred times over. In those days, your mother had the shyest eyes. If there was something pretty about your mother, it was those eyes. They could really win you over. You go in my place, she kept saying. So I went. I took courage from the darkness and from something else your mother didn't know. And that was that she wasn't the only one who liked Pedro Pedamo. I crawled into bed with him. I was happy to. I wanted to. I cuddled right up against him. But all the celebrating had worn him out, and he spent the whole night snoring. All he did was wedge his legs between mine. Before dawn, I got up and went to Dolores. I said to her, You go now. It's a new day. What did he do to you? She asked me. I'm still not sure, I told her. You were born the next year. But I wasn't your mother, though. You came, within an you came within a hair of being mine. Maybe your mother was ashamed to tell you about it. Green pastures, watching the horizon rise and fall as the wind swirled through the wheat, an afternoon rippling with curling lines of rain, the color of the earth, the smell of alfalfa and bread, a town that smelled like spilled honey. She always hated Pedro Peramo. Doloritas, did she tell them to get my breakfast? Your mother was up every morning before dawn. She would start the fire from the coals, and with the smell of the tinder, the cats would wake up, back and forth through the house, followed by her guard of cats, Doña Doloritas. I wonder how many times your mother heard that call. Doña Doloritas, this is cold. It won't do. How many times, and even though she used to, and even though she was used to the worst of times, those shy eyes of hers grew hard. 
not to know any taste but the savor of orange blossoms in the warmth of summer. Then she began her sighing. Why are you sighing so, Doloritas? I had gone with them that afternoon. We were in the middle of a field watching the bevies of young thrushes. One solitary buzzard rocked lazily in the sky. Why are you sighing, Doloritas? I wish I were a buzzard, a buzzard so I could fly to where my sister lives. That's the last straw, Doña Doloritas. You'll see your sister all right. Right now, we're going back to the house and you're going to pack your suitcases. That was the last straw. And your mother went. I'll see you soon, Don Pedro. Goodbye, Doloritas. And she never came back to the Media Luna. Some months later, I asked Pedro Piramo about her. She loved her sister more than she did me. I guess she's happy there. Besides, I was getting fed up with her. I have no intention of asking about her, if that's what's worrying you. But how will they get along? Let God look after them. Make him pay, son, for all those years he put us out of his mind. And that's how it was until she advised me that you were coming to see me. We never heard from her again. A lot has happened since then, I told Edjuvigis. We lived in Colima. We were taken in by my Aunt Gertrudis, who threw it in our faces every day that we were a burden. She used to ask my mother, why don't you go back to your husband? Oh, has he sent for me? I'm not going back unless he asks me to. I came because I wanted to see you, because I loved you. That's why I came. I know that, but it's time for you to leave. If it was up to me. I thought that Ejuviges was listening to me. I noticed, though, that her head was tilted as if she were listening to some far away sound. Then she said, when will you rest? The day you went away, I knew I would never see you again. You were stained red by the late afternoon sun, by the dusk filling the sky with blood. You were smiling. You had often said of the town you were leaving behind. I like it because of you, but I hate everything else about it, even having been born here. I thought, she will never come back. I will never see her again. What are you doing here at this hour? Aren't you working? No, grandmother. Rogelio asked me to mind his little boy. I'm just walking him around. I can't do both things, the kid and the telegraph. Meanwhile, he's down in the pool room drinking beer. On top of everything else, he doesn't pay me anything. You're not there to be paid. You're there to learn. Once you know something, then you can afford to make demands. For now, you're just an apprentice. Maybe one day you'll be the boss. But for that, you need patience and above all, humility. If they want you to take the boy for a walk, do it for heaven's sake. You must learn to be patient. Let others be patient, grandmother. I'm not one for patience. You and your wild ideas. I'm afraid you have a hard row ahead of you, Pedro Peramo. What was that I just heard, Doña Eduviges? She shook her head as if waking from a dream. That's Miguel Peramo's horse galloping down the road to the Media Luna. There's someone living there? No, no, no one's living there. But it's only his horse coming and going. They were never apart. It roams the countryside looking for him, and it's always about this time it comes back. It may be that the poor creature can't live with its remorse. Even animals realize when they've done something bad, don't they? I don't understand. I, don't, I didn't hear anything that sounded like a horse. No, no. Then it must be my sixth sense, a gift God gave me, or maybe a curse. All I know is I've suffered because of it. She said nothing for a while, but then added, It all began with Miguel Paramo. I was the only one knew everything that happened the night he died. I'd already gone to bed when I heard his horse, his horse galloping back toward the Media Luna. I was surprised because Miguel never came home at that hour. It was always early morning before he got back. He went every night to be with his sweetheart over in a town called Contla, a good distance from here. He left early and got back late, but that night he never returned. You hear it now? Of course you can hear it. It's his horse coming home. I don't hear anything. Then it's just me. Well, like I was saying, the fact that he didn't come back was the whole story. His horse had no more than gone by when I heard something rapping at my window. Now you be the judge of whether it was my imagination. 
What I know is that something made me get up and go see who it was. And it was him, Miguel Paramo. I wasn't surprised to see him because there was once a time when he spent every night at my house, sleeping with me until he met that girl who drank his blood. What's happened? I asked Miguel Paramo. Did she give you the gate? No, she still loves me, he said. The problem is that I couldn't locate her. I couldn't find my way to the town. There was a lot of mist or smoke or something. I don't know that Contla isn't there anymore. I rode right past where it ought to be, according to my calculations, and there was nothing there. I've come to tell you about it because I know you will understand. If I told anyone else in, Co in Komala, they'd say I'm crazy, the way they always have. No, not crazy, Miguel. You must be dead. Remember, everyone told you that horse would be the death of you one day. Remember that, Miguel Peramo. Maybe you did something crazy, but that's another matter now. All I did was jump the new stone fence my father had built. I asked El Corolado to jump it so I wouldn't have to go all the way around, the way you have to now, to get to the road. I know that I jumped it and then kept on riding, but like I told you, everything was smoke, smoke, smoke. Your father's going to be sick with grief in the morning. I told him. I feel sorry for him. Now go and rest in peace, Miguel. I think I, I, I thank you for coming to say goodbye. And I closed the window. Before dawn, a ranch hand from the Media Luna came to tell me, the patron is asking for you. Young Miguel is dead. Don Pedro wants your company. I already knew, I told him. Did they tell you to cry? Yes. Don Fulger told me to cry when I told you. All right. You tell Don Pedro that I'll be there. How long ago did they bring him back? No more than half an hour. If it'd been sooner, maybe they could have saved him. Although the doctor who looked him over said he had been cold for some time. We learned about it when El Colorado came home with an empty saddle and made such a stir that no one could sleep. You know him and you know how him and that horse loved one another. As for he, I think the animal is suffering more than Don Pedro. He hasn't eaten or slept and all he does is chase around in circles. Like he knows, you know? Like he feels all broken and chewed up inside. Don't forget to close the door as you go. And with that, the hand from the media luna left. Have you ever heard the moan of a dead man? She asked me. No, Doña Iduviges. You're lucky. Drops are falling steadily on the stone trough. The air carries the sound of the clear water escaping the stone and falling into the storage urn. He is conscious of sounds, feet scraping the ground back and forth, back and forth, the endless dripping, the urn overflows, spilling water onto the wet earth. Wake up, someone is saying. He hears the sound of the voice. He tries to identify it, but he sinks back down and drowses again, crushed by the weight of sleep. Hands tug at the covers. He snuggles beneath their warmth, seeking peace. Wake up. Again, someone is calling. That someone is shaking his shoulders, making him sit up. He half opens his eyes. Again, he hears the dripping of water falling from the stone into the brimming urn and those shuffling footsteps and weeping. Then he heard the weeping. That was what woke him, a soft but penetrating weeping that, because it was so delicate, was able to slip through the mesh of sleep and reach the place where his fear lived. Slowly, he got out of bed. He saw a woman's face resting against the doorframe, still darkened by night. The woman was sobbing. Why are you crying, Mama? He asked. The minute his feet touched down the floor, he recognized his mother's face. Your father is dead, she said. And then, as if her coiled grief had suddenly burst free, she turned and turned into a tight circle until hands grasped her shoulders and stopped the spiraling of her tortured body. Through the door, he could see the dawn. There were no stars. Only a leaden gray sky still untouched by the rays of the sun, a drab light that seemed more like the onset of night than the beginning of day. Outside in the patio, the footsteps like people wandering in circles, muted sounds, and inside the woman standing in the doorway, her body impeding the arrival of day. Through her arms, he glimpses pieces of sky and beneath her feet, trickles of light, a damp light as if the floor beneath the woman were flooded with tears and then sobbing, again soft but penetrating weeping and the grief contouring her body with pain. 
They've killed your father. And you, mother, who, who killed you? There is wind and sun, and there are clouds, high above blue sky, and beyond that there may be songs, perhaps sweeter voices. In a word, hope. There is hope for us, hope to ease our sorrows. But not for you, Miguel Padamo, for you died without forgiveness, and you will never know God's grace. Father and Tirdia walked around the corpse, reciting the mass for the dead. He hurried in order to finish quickly, and he left without offering the final benediction to the people who filled the church. Father, we want you to bless him. No, he said, shaking his head emphatically. I won't give my blessing. He was an evil man, and he shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. God will not smile on me if I intercede for him. As he spoke, he clasped his hands tightly, hoping to conceal their trembling, to no avail. That corpse weighed heavily on the soul of everyone present. It lay on a dais in the center of the church, surrounded with new candles and flowers. A father stood there, alone, waiting for the mass to end. Father and Teria walked past Pedro Penamo, trying not to brush against him. He raised the aspergillium gently, sprinkling holy water from the top of the coffin to the bottom, while a murmur issued from his lips that might have been a prayer. Then he knelt, and everyone knelt with him. O oh God, have mercy on this your servant. May he rest in peace. Amen. The voices chorused. Then, as his rage was building anew, he saw that everyone was leaving the church and that they were carrying out the body of Miguel Peramo. Pedro Peramo approached him and knelt beside him. I know you hated him, father, and with reason. Rumor has it that your brother was murdered by my son, and you believe that your niece Anna was raped by him. Then there were his insults and his lack of respect. Those are all reasons anyone could understand. But forget all that now, Father. Weigh him and forgive him as perhaps God has forgiven him. He placed a handful of gold coins on the pre dieu and got to his feet. Take this as a gift for your church. The church was empty now. Two men stood in the doorway waiting for Pedro Peramo. He joined them, and together they followed the coffin that had been waiting for them, resting on the shoulders of four foremen from the Media Luna. Father Denteria picked up the coins one by one and walked to the altar. These are yours, he said. He can afford to buy salvation. Only you know whether this is the price. As for me, Lord, I throw myself at your feet and ask for justice or injustice that any of us may ask. For my part, I hope you damn him to hell and he closed the chapel. He walked to the, to the sacristy, threw himself into a corner, and sat there weeping with grief and sorrow until his tears were exhausted. All right, Lord, you win, he said. At supper time, he drank his hot chocolate as he did every night. He felt calm. So, Anita, do you know who was buried today? No, uncle. You remember Miguel Peramo? Yes, uncle. Well, that's who. Anna hung her head. You are sure he was the one, aren't you? I'm not positive, Uncle. No, I never saw his face. He surprised me at night, and it was dark. Then how did you know it was Miguel Peramo? Because he said so. It's Miguel Peramo, Anna. Don't be afraid. That was what he said. But you knew he was responsible for your father's death, didn't you? Yes, Uncle. So... What did you do to make him leave? I didn't do anything. The two sat without speaking. They could hear the warm breeze stirring in the myrtle leaves. He said that was why he had come, to say he was sorry and to ask me to forgive him. I still lay in my bed, and I told him the window was open, and he came in. The first thing he did was put his arms around me, as if that was his way of asking forgiveness for what he had done, and I smiled at him. I remembered what you had taught me, that we must never hate anyone. I smiled to let him know that, but then I realized that he couldn't see my smile because it was so black, and that I couldn't see him. I only felt his body on top of me, and feel him beginning to do bad things to me. I thought he was going to kill me. That's what I believed, uncle. Then I stopped thinking at all, so I would be dead before he killed me. But I guess he didn't dare. 
I knew he hadn't when I opened my eyes and saw the morning light shining in the open window. Up until then, I felt that I had in fact died. But you must have some way of being sure. His voice. Didn't you recognize him by his voice? I didn't recognize him at all. All I knew about him was that he had killed my father. I had never seen him, and afterward, I never saw him again. I couldn't have faced him, uncle. But you knew who he was. Yes, and what he was. And I know that by now he must be in the deepest pits of hell. I prayed to all the saints with all my heart and soul. Don't be too sure of that, my child. Who knows how many people are praying for him? You are alone, one prayer against thousands, and among them, some much more intense than yours, like his father's. He was about to say, and anyway, I have pardoned him. But he only thought it. He did not want to add hurt to the girl's already broken spirit. Instead, he took her arm and said, Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, who has taken him from this earth, where he caused such harm. What does it matter if he lifted him to heaven? A horse galloped by the place where the main street crosses the road to Contla. No one saw it. Nevertheless, a woman waiting on the outskirts of the village told that she had seen the horse and that its front legs were buckled as if about to roll head over hooves. She recognized it as Miguel Paramos's chestnut stallion. The thought had even crossed her mind that the animal was going to break its neck. Then she saw it regain its footing and without any interruption in stride race off with its head twisted back as if frightened by something it had left behind. That story reached the media luna on the night of the burial as the men were resting after the long walk back from the cemetery. They were talking as people talk everywhere before turning in. That death pained me in more ways than one, said Terencio Lubianes. My shoulders are still sore. Mine too, said his brother Aviado, and my bunions must have swelled an inch. And because the patron wanted us to wear shoes, you'd have thought it was a holy day, right, Torib Toribio? What do you want me to say? I think it was none too soon he died. In a few days, there was more news from Contla. It came from the latest ox cart. They were saying that his spirit is wandering over there. They've seen it rapping at the window of a lady friend. It was just like him, chaps and all. And do you think that Don Pedro, with that disposition of his, would allow his son to keep calling on the women? I can just imagine what he'd say if he found out. All right, he'd say, you're dead now. You keep to your grave and leave the affairs to us. And if he caught him wandering around, you can bet he'd put him back in the ground for good. You're right about that, Isaias. The old man doesn't put up with much. The driver went on his way. I'm just telling you what he what was told to me. Shooting stars, they fell as if the sky were raining fire. Look at that, said Torencio. Please look at the show they're putting on up there. Must be celebrating Megalito's arrival, Jesus put in. You don't think it's a bad omen? Bad for who? Maybe your sister's lonesome and wants him back. Who are you talking to? To you. It's time to go, boys. We've traveled a long road today, and we have to be up early tomorrow. And they faded into the night like shadows. Shooting stars one by one, the lights in Comla went out. Then the sky took over the night. Father and Teria tossed and turned in his bed, unable to sleep. It's all my fault, he said to himself. Everything that's happening, because I'm afraid to offend people who provide for me. It's true. I owe them my livelihood. I get nothing from the poor, and God knows prayers don't fill a stomach. That's how it's been up to now, and we're seeing the consequence. All my fault. I have betrayed those who love me and have put their faith in me and come to me to intercede on their behalf with God. What has their faith won them? Heaven? Or the purification of their souls? And why purify their souls anyway when at the last moment... I will never forget Maria Dayara's face when she came to ask me to save her sister Edjuviges. She always served her fellow man. She gave them everything she had. She even gave them sons, all of them, and took the infants to their fathers to be recognized. But none of them wanted to. Then she told them, in that case, I'll be the father as well, even though fate chose me to be the mother. Everyone took advantage of her hospitality and her good nature. She never wanted to offend or set anyone against her. But she took her own life. 
She acted against the will of God. She had no choice. That was another thing she did out of the goodness of her heart. She fell short at the last hour. That's what I told Maria Diada. At the last minute, so many good acts stored up for her salvation and then to lose them like that all at once. But she didn't lose them. She died of her sorrows. And sorrow, you once told us something about sorrow that I can't remember now. It was because of her sorrow she went away and died choking on her own blood. I can still see how she looked. That face was the saddest face I have ever seen on a human. Perhaps with many prayers. We're already saying many prayers, Father. I mean, maybe, just perhaps with Gregorian masses. But for that, we would need help. Help to bring priests here. And that costs money. And there before my eyes was the face of Maria Diada, a poor woman still ripe with children. I don't have money. You know that, Father. Let's leave things as they are. Let us put our hope in God. Yes, Father. Why did she look courageous in her resignation? And what would it, and what would it have cost him to grant pardon when it was so easy to say a word or two, or a hundred if a hundred were needed to save a soul? What did he know of heaven and hell? And yet even an old priest buried in a nameless town knew who had deserved heaven. He knew the role. He began to run through the list of saints in the Catholic pantheon, beginning with the saints for each day of the calendar. Saint Nunilona, virgin and martyr, Anercio, bishop, Saint Salome, widow, and Elodia or Elodia and Nolina, virgins, Cordula and Donato. And on down the line, he was drifting off to sleep when he sat up straight in his bed. Here I am, reciting the saints as if I were counting sheep. He went outside and looked at the sky. It was raining stars. He was sorry because he would rather have seen a tranquil sky. He heard roosters crowing. He felt the mantle of night covering the earth, the earth, this veil of tears. You're lucky, son. Very lucky, Eduviges Dayata told me. It was very late by now. The lamp in the corner was beginning to grow dim. It flickered and went out. I sensed that the woman rose, and I suppose she was leaving to get another lamp. I listened to her receding footsteps. I sat there, waiting. After a while, when I realized that she was not coming back, I got up too. I inched my way forward, groping in the darkness until I reached my room. I lay down on the floor to wait for sleep to come. I slept fitfully. It was during one of those intervals that I heard the cry. It was a drawn-out cry, like the howl of a drunk. I, life, I am too good for you. I sat bolt upright because it had sounded almost in my ear. It could have been in the street, but I had heard it here, sticking to the walls of my room. When I awoke, everything was silent, nothing but the sound of moths working at the murmur of silence. No, there was no way to judge the depth of the silence that followed that scream. It was as if the earth existed in a vacuum, no sound, not even of my breathing or the beating of my heart, as if the very sound of consciousness had been stilled, and just when the pause ended and I was regaining my calm, the cry was repeated. I heard it for a long, long while. You owe me something, even if it's nothing more than a hanged man's right to a last word. Then the door was flung open. Is that you, Dona Eduviges? I called. What's going on? Were you afraid? My name isn't Eduviges. I am Damiana. I heard you were here, and I've come to see you. I want you to come sleep at my house. You'll be able to rest there. Damiana Cisneros? Aren't you one of the women who lived at Media Luna? I do live there. That's why it took so long to get here. My mother told me about a woman named Damiana who looked after me when I was born. Was that you? Yes, I am the one. I've known you since you first opened your eyes. I'll be glad to come. I can't get any rest here because of the yelling. Didn't you hear it? How they were murdering someone. Didn't you hear it just now? It may be some echo trapped in here. A long time ago, they hanged Toribo Aldrete in his room. Then they locked the door and left him to turn to leather and left him to turn to leather so he would never find rest. I don't know how you got in when there isn't any key to open this door. It was Dona Evidges who opened it. She told me it was the only room she had available. Edjuviges Diada? 
Yes, she was the one. Poor Eduvigius. That must mean she's still wandering like a lost soul. I, Fulgar Sedano, 54 years of age, bachelor, administrator by profession, and skilled in filing and prosecuting lawsuits by the power invested in me and by my own authority, do claim and allege the following. That was when he had written, when he had filed the complaint against deeds committed by Tor Toribio Aldrete, and he had ended, the charge is falsifying boundaries. There's no one can, there's no one can call you less than a man, Don Fulger. I know you can hold your own, and not because of the power behind you, but on your own account. He remembered that this was the first thing Aldrete had told him after they began drinking together, reputedly to celebrate the complaint. Well, we'll wipe our asses with this paper, you and I, Don Fulger, because that's all it's good for. You know that. In other words, as far as you're concerned, you've done your part and cleared the air because you had me worried, which anyone might be. But now I know what it's all about. It makes me laugh. Falsify boundaries? Me? If he's that stupid, your patron should be red in the face. He remembered they had been at Eduvigigas place he had even asked her, say, Viges, can you let me have the corner room? Whatever rooms you want, Don Fulger. If you want, take them all. Are your men going to spend the night? No, I, I just need one. Don't worry about us. Just go to bed. Just just leave us the key. Well, like I told you, Don Fulger, Toribio Aldrete had said, there's no one can doubt your manhood, but I'm fucking well fed up with that shit ass son of your patron. He remembered it was the last thing he heard with all his wits about him. Later, he had acted like a coward, yelling, Power behind me, you say? Is that right? He used the butt of his whip to knock at Pedro Peramos's door. He thought of the first time he had done that two weeks earlier. He waited as he had that first time. And again, as he had then, he examined the black bow hanging over the door. But he did not comment again. Well, how about that? They've hung one over the other. The first one's faded now, but the new one shines like silk, even though you can see it's just something they've dyed. That first time, he had waited so long that he'd begun to think maybe no one was home. He was just leaving when Pedro Paramo finally appeared. Come in, my friend. It was the second time they had met. The first time, only he had been aware of the meeting because it was right after little Pedro was born. And this time, you might almost say it was the first time. And here he was being treated like an equal. How about that? Fulgor followed with long strides, slapping his whip against his leg. Soon he'll learn that I'm the man who knows what's what. He'll learn and know why I've come. Sit down, Fulgor. We can speak at our ease here. They were in the horse corral. Pedro Paramo made himself comfortable on a feed trough and waited. Don't you want to sit down? I prefer to stand, Pedro, as you like, but don't forget the dawn. Who did the boy think he was to speak to him like that? Not even his father, Don Lucas Paramo, had dared do that. So the very first thing this kid, who had never stepped foot on the media luna or done a lick of work, was talking to him as if he were a hired hand. How about that? So, what shape is the operation in? Sedano felt this was his opportunity. Now it's my turn, he thought. Not so good. There's nothing left. We've sold off the last head of cattle. He began taking out papers to show Pedro Padamo how much he owed, and he was just and he was just ready to say, We owe such and such, when he heard the boy ask, Who do we owe it to? I'm not interested in how much, just who to. Fulgor ran down the list of names and ended, There's nowhere to get the money to pay. That's the crux of the problem. Why not? Because your family ate it all up. They borrowed and borrowed without ever returning any of it. One day you have to pay the piper, I always used to say. One of these days they're going to have everything there is. Well, that's what's happened. Now, I know someone who might be interested in buying the land. They'll pay a good price. It will cover your outstanding debts with a little left over, though not very much. That someone wouldn't be you. What makes you think it's me? I'm suspicious of my own shadow. Tomorrow, we'll begin to set our affairs in order. We'll begin with the Preciado women. 
You say it's them who owe the most? Yes, and them we've paid the least. Your father always left the Preciados to the last. I understand that one of the girls, Matilda, went to live in the city. I don't know whether it was Gua Guadalajara or Colima. And that Lola, that is, Doña Dolores, has been left in charge of everything. You know, of Don Emilio's ranch. She's the one we have to pay. Then tomorrow I want you to go and ask for Lola's hand. What makes you think she'd have me? I'm an old man. You'll ask her for me. After all, she's not without her charms. Tell her I am very much in love with her. Ask her if she likes the idea. And on the way, ask Father Interio to make the arrangements. How much money can you get together? Not a centavo, Don Pedro. Well, promise him something. Tell him the minute I have any money, I'll pay him. I'm pretty sure he won't stand in the way. Do it tomorrow, early. And what about Eldrete? What does Eldrete have to do with anything? You told me about the Preciado women and the Fregosos and the Guzmans. So what's this about Eldrete? It's the matter of the boundaries. He's been putting up fences, and now he wants us to put up the last part in order to establish the property lines. Leave that for later. You're not to worry about fences. They're not going to be any fences. The land's not to be divided up. Think about that, Fulger, but don't tell anyone just yet. For now, first thing, set it up with Lola. Sure you won't sit down? I will, Don Pedro. God's truth. I'm beginning to like working with you. You string Lola a line and tell her I love her. That's important. It's true, Sedano. I do love her because of her eyes, you know. You do that first thing in the morning, and I'll relieve you of some of your administrative duties. You can leave the media Luna to me. I wonder where in the hell the boy learned those tricks Fulger Sedano thought on his second trip to the media Luna. I never expected anything from him. He's worthless, my old patron Don Lucas used to say, a born weakling, and I couldn't argue. When I die, Fulger, you look for another job. I will, Don Lucas. I tell you, Fulger, I tried sending him to the seminary, hoping that at least he would have enough to eat and could look after his mother when I'm no longer here, but he didn't even stick with that. You deserve better, Don Lucas. Don't count on him for anything, not even to care for me when I'm old. He's turned out bad, Fulger, and that's that. That's a real shame, Don Lucas. And now this. If the media Luna hadn't meant so much to him, he'd never have called on Miguel. He'd have left without contacting him. But he loved that land, the barren hills that had been worked year in and year out, and still accepted the plow, giving more every year. Beloved Media Luna, and each new addition, like in Medio's land, come to me, sweetheart. He could see it as if it were already done. And what does a woman matter after all? Damn right, he said, slapping the whip against his leg as he walked through the main door of the hacienda. It had been easy enough to gall Dolores. Her eyes shone and her face showed her discomposure. Forgive me for blushing, Don Fulger. I can't believe Don Pedro ever noticed me. He can't sleep for thinking about you, but he has so many to choose from. There are so many pretty girls in Comala. What will they say when they find out? He thinks of no one but you, Dolores, nobody but you. You give me the shivers, Don Fulgor. I never dreamed. It's because he's a man of so few words. Don Lucas Peramo, may he rest in peace, actually told him you weren't good enough for him. So out of obedience, he kept his silence. But now his father's gone. There's nothing to stand in the way. It was his first decision, although I've been slow to carry it out because of all the things I had to do. We'll set the wedding for day after tomorrow. How does that suit you? Isn't that awfully soon? I don't have anything ready. I'll need time to get my trousseau together. I, I want to write my sister. No, I'll send her a letter by messenger. But no matter what, I won't be ready by the, I won't be ready before the 8th of April. Today is the 1st. Yes, the earliest would be the 8th. Ask him to wait just a few short days longer. He wishes it were this minute. It's, if, if it's just a matter of your wedding dress, we'll provide that. Don Pedro's dear dead mother wouldn't want you, would want you to have hers. It's a family custom. But there's another reason I want those extra days. It's a woman's matter, you know. Oh, I, I'm so embarrassed to say this, Don Fulger. M my face must be a hundred colors, but it's my time of the month. Oh, I'm so ashamed. What does that have to do with it? Marriage isn't a question of your time or not your time. It's a matter of loving each other. 
When you have that, nothing else matters. But you don't understand what I'm saying, Don Fulgor. I understand the wedding will be day after tomorrow. And he left her with arms outstretched, begging for one week, just one week. I mustn't forget to tell Don Pedro. God, that Pedro's a sharp boy. I mustn't forget to tell him. Remember to tell the judge to put the property to put the property in joint ownership. Don't forget now, Fulgor, to tell him first thing tomorrow. Meanwhile, Dolores was running to the kitchen with a water jug to set water to boil. I'll have to try to bring it on sooner, this very night. But whatever I do, it will still last three days. There's no way around it. But oh, I'm so happy, so happy. Thank you, God, for giving me Don Pedro. And then she added, even if later he does get tired of me, I've asked for and she's I've asked her and she's for it. The priest wants 60 pesos to overlook the matter of the bands. I told him he'd get it in due time. He says he needs it to fix the altar and that his dining room table is on his last legs. I promised that we'd send him a few, that we'd send him a new table. He says you never come to mass. I promised him you would. And since your grandmother died, he says no one here has tithed. I told him not to worry. He'll go along. You didn't ask for a little advance from Dolores? No, Patron, I didn't dare. That's the truth. She was so happy I didn't want to dim her enthusiasm. What a baby you are. A baby, he says, me, with all my 55 years? Look at him, just beginning to live, and me only a few steps from the grave. I didn't want to spoil her happiness. In spite of everything, you're still a kid. Anything you say, Patron. Next week, I want you to go over to see Aldrete. Tell him to check his fences. He's on, Med he's on Media Luna land. He did a good job measuring the boundary lines. I can vouch for that. Well, tell him he made a mistake, that he didn't figure right. If necessary, tear down the fences. And the law? What law, Fulgor? From now on, we're the law. Do you have any hard asses working on the Media Luna? Well, there's one or two. Send them over to do business with Aldrete. You draw up a compl you draw up a complaint accusing him of squatting on our land or whatever occurs to you, and remind him that Lucas Paramo is dead and that from now on he'll be dealing with me. There were only a few clouds in the still blue sky. Higher up, air was stirring, but down below it was still and hot. Again, he looked with the butt of the whip, if only to assert his presence. Still, since he knew by now that no one would open until Pedro Panamo fancied, seeing the black bows above the door, he thought, those ribbons look pretty, one for each. At the moment, the door opened, and he stepped inside. Come in, Fulgor. Did you take care of Toribio Aldrete? That job's done, Patron. We still have the matter of the Fregosos. We'll let that ride. Right now, I'm all wrapped up in my honeymoon. This town is filled with echoes. It's like they were trapped behind the walls or beneath the cobblestones. When you walk, you feel like something's behind you, stepping in your footsteps. You hear rustlings and people laughing, laughter that sounds used up, and voices worn away by the years. Sounds like that. But I think the day will come when those sounds fade away. That was what Damiana Cisneros was telling me as we walked through the town. There was a time when night after night I could hear the sounds of a fiesta. I could hear the noise clear out at the Media Luna. I would walk into town to see what the uproar was about. And this is what I would see. Just what we are seeing now. Nothing. No one. The streets as empty as they are now. Then I didn't hear anything anymore. You know, you can get worn out celebrating. That's why I wasn't surprised when it ended. Yes, Damiana Cisneros repeated. This town is filled with echoes. I'm not afraid anymore. I, I hear the dogs howling and, and I let them howl. And on windy days, I see the wind blowing leaves from the trees when anyone can see that there aren't any trees here. There must have been once. Otherwise, where do the leaves come from? And the worst of all is when you hear people talking about the voices seem to be coming through a crack, and yet so clear you can recognize who's speaking. In fact, just now as I was coming here, I happened upon a wake. I stopped to recite the Lord's Prayer. And while I was praying, one woman stepped away from the others and came towards me and said, Damiana, pray for me, Damiana. Her rebozo fell away from her face, 
and I recognized my sister, Sixtina. What are you doing here? I asked her. Then she ran back and hid among the other women. In case you didn't know, my sister Sixtina died when I was 12 years old. She was the oldest. There were 16 of us, so you can figure how long she's been dead. And look at her now, still wandering through this world. So don't be afraid if you hear newer echoes, Juan Preciado. Was it my mother who told you I was coming? I asked. No. And by the way, whatever happened to your mother? She died, I replied. Died? What of? I don't really know. Sadness, maybe. She sighed a lot. That's bad. Every sigh is like a drop of your life being swallowed up. Well, so she's dead. Yes, I thought maybe you knew. Why would I know? I haven't heard a thing from her in years. Then how did you know about me? Damiana did not answer. Are you alive, Damiana? Tell me, Damiana. Suddenly, I was alone in those empty streets through the windows of roofless houses. You could see the tough stems of tall weeds and meager thatch revealing crumbling adobe. Damiana, I called. Damiana Cisneros. The echo replied, Ana Neros, Ana Neros. I heard dogs barking as if I had roused them. I saw a man crossing the street. Hey, you, I called. Hey, you, came back my own voice. As if they were just around the next corner, I heard two women talking. Well, look who's coming toward us. Isn't that Filoteo Arechiga? The very one. Pretend you don't see him. Even better, let's leave. And if he walks after us, it means he wants something of one of us. Which one of us do you think he's following? It must be you. Well, I figure it's you he wants. Oh, we don't have to run anymore. He stopped back on the corner. Then it wasn't either of us, you see? But what if it had been? What then? Don't get ideas. It's a good thing he didn't. Everyone says he's the one who gets girls for Don Pedro, which just missed being us. Is that right? Well, I don't want to have anything to do with that old man. We better go. Yes, let's let's go home. Night, long after midnight, and the voices. I'm telling you that if we had a good corn crop this year, I'll be able to pay you. But if we lose it, well, you'll just have to wait. I'm not pushing you. You know I've been patient with you, but it's not your land. You've been working land that's not yours. So where are you going to get the money to pay me? And who says the land isn't mine? I heard you sold it to Pedro Piramo. I haven't been anywhere near him. The land's still mine. That's what you say. But everyone is saying it's his. Just let them say that to me. Look, Galileo, just between the two of us, in confidence, I like you a lot. After all, you're my sister's husband, and I never heard anyone say that you don't treat her well. But don't try to tell me you didn't sell the land. I do tell you I haven't sold it to anyone. Well, it belongs to Pedro Peramo. I know that's how he means to be. Didn't Don Fulgor come see you? No. Then you can't be sure he'll be here tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, someday soon. Then one of us will die, but he's not going to get his way on this. Rest in peace. Amen, dear brother-in-law. Just in case. I'll be around. You'll see. Don't worry about me. My mother tanned my hide enough to make me good and tough. Till tomorrow, then. Tell Felicitas that I won't be to dinner tonight. I wouldn't want to have to say later I, I was with him the night before he died. We'll save something for you in case you change your mind at the last minute. Receding footsteps sounded to the jungle of spurs. Tomorrow morning at dawn, you're coming with me, Chona. I have the team hitched up. And what if my father has fit and has a fit and dies? As old as he is, I, I'd never forgive myself if something happened to him because of me. I'm the only one he has to see that he takes care. I'm the only one that sees that he takes care of himself. There's no one else. Why are you in such a hurry to steal me from him? Wait just a little longer. It won't be long till he dies. That's what you told me last year. You even taunted me for not being willing to take a chance. And from what you said then, you were fed up with everything. I've harnessed the mules and they're ready. Are you coming with me? Let me think about it. Chona. You don't know how much I want you. I can't stand it any longer, Chona. One way or another, you're coming with me. I need to think about it. 
Try to understand. We have to wait until he dies. It won't be long now. Then I'll go with you and we won't have to run away. You told me that too a year ago. And so, Chona, I had to hire the mules. They're ready. They're just waiting for you. Let him get along on his own. You're pretty. You're young. Some old woman will come look after him. There's more than enough kind souls to go around. I can't. Yes, you can. I can't. It hurts me. You know that. But he is my father. Then there's nothing more to say. I'll go see Juliana. She's crazy about me. Fine. I won't tell you not to. Then you don't want to see me tomorrow? No, I don't ever want to see you again. Sounds, voices, murmurs, distant singing. My sweetheart gave me a lace-bordered handkerchief to dry my tears. High voices, as if it were women singing. I watch the carts creaking by, the slowly moving oxen, the crunching of stones beneath the wheels, the men seeming to doze. Every morning early the town trembles from the passing carts. They come from everywhere, loaded with niter, ears of corn and fodder. The wheels crack and groan until the windows rattle and wake the people inside. There is also the hour when the ovens are opened and you can smell the new baked bread. Suddenly it will be thunder and rain, maybe springs on its way. You'll get used to the suddenlies there, my son. Empty carts churning the silence of the streets, fading into the dark road of night, and shadows, the echo of shadows. I thought of leaving. Up the hill I could sense the track I had followed when I came, like an open wound through the blackness of the mountains. Then someone touched my shoulder. What are you doing here? I came to look for... I was going to say the name, but stopped. I came to look for my father. Why don't you come in? I went in. Half the room had fallen in on the house. The tiles lay on the ground, the roof on the ground, and in the other half were a man and a woman. Are you dead? I asked them. The woman smiled. The man's gaze was serious. He's drunk, the man said. He's just scared, said the woman. There's some... There's, there was an oil stove, a, a reed cot, and a crude chair where the woman's clothes were laid, because she was naked, just as God had sent her into the world. And the man, too. We heard someone moaning and butting his head against our door. And there you were. What happened to you? So many things have happened that all I want to do is sleep. That's what we were doing. Let's all sleep, then. My memories began to fade with the light of dawn. From time to time, I heard the sounds of words and marked a difference, because until then, I realized the words I had heard had been silent. There had been no sound. I had sensed them. But silently, the way you hear words in your dreams. Who could he be? The woman was asking. Who knows? The man replied. I wonder what brought him here. Who knows? I think I heard him say something about his father. I heard him say that, too. You don't think he's lost. Remember when those people happened by who said they were lost? They were looking for a place called Los Confines, and you told them that you didn't know where it was. Yes, I remember. But let me sleep. It's not dawn yet. But it will be before long, and I'm talking to you because I want you to wake up. You told me to remind you before dawn. That's why I'm doing it. Get up. You want me to get up? I don't know why. You told me last night to wake you. You didn't tell me why. If that's your only reason, then let me sleep. Didn't you hear what the man said when he came? To let him sleep. That was all he had to say. It seemed as if the voices were moving away, fading, being choked off. No one was saying anything now. It was a dream. But after a while, it began again. He moved. I'll bet he's about to wake up, and if he sees us here, he'll ask questions. What questions can he ask? Well, he'll have to say something, won't he? Leave him alone. He must be very tired. You think so? That's enough, woman. Look, he's moving. See how he's tossing? Like something inside him was jerking him around. I know because that's what happened to me. What's happened to you? That? I don't know what you're talking about. I, I wouldn't mention it except that when I was that when I see him tossing in his sleep like that, I, I remember what happened to me the first time you did it to me, how it hurt and how bad I felt for doing it. What do you mean, it? How it felt right after you did it to me, and somehow, whether you like it or not, I knew it wasn't done right. 
Are you going to start fat again? Why don't you go to sleep and let me sleep too? You asked me to remind you that's what I'm doing. Dear God, I'm doing what you asked me to do. Come on, it's almost time for you to get up. Leave me alone, woman. The man seemed to sleep. The woman kept on scolding, but in a quiet voice. It must be after dawn by now because I can see the light. I can see the man from here. And if I can see him, it's only because there is enough light to see. The sun will be up before long. I don't need to tell you that. What do you bet he's done something wrong and we took him in? It doesn't matter that it's only for tonight. We hid him. And in the long run, that will mean trouble for us. Look how restless he is, as if he can't get comfortable. I'll bet he has a heavy load on his soul. It was growing lighter. Day was routing the shadows, erasing them. The room where I lay was warm with the heat of sleeping bodies. I sensed the dawn light through my eyelids. I felt the light. I heard, he's thrashing around like he's damned. He's had all the earmarks of an evil man. Get up, Donis. Look at him. Look how he's writhing there on the ground, twisting and turning. He's drooling. He must have killed a lot of people, and you don't even see it. Poor devil. Go to sleep and let us sleep. How can I sleep if I'm not sleepy? Get up, then, and go somewhere. You won't be pestering me. I will. I'll go light the fire. And as I go, I'll tell you what's his name to come. And as I go, I'll tell what's his name to come sleep here by you, here in my place. You tell him that. I can't. I'd be afraid to. Then go about your work and leave us alone. I'm going to. What are you waiting for? I'm on my way. I heard the woman get out of bed. Her bare feet thudded on the ground and she stepped over my head. I opened and closed my eyes. When I opened them again, the sun was high in the sky. Beside me sat a clay jug of coffee. I tried to drink it. I took a few swallows. It's all we have. I'm sorry it's so little. We're, we're so short of everything, so, so short. It was a woman's voice. Don't worry on my account, I told her. Don't worry about me. I'm, I'm used to it. How do I get out of here? Where are you going? Anywhere. There's dozens of roads. One goes to Kontla, and there's another that comes from, that comes from there. One leads straight to the mountains. I don't know where the one goes you can see from here. And she pointed past the hole in the roof, the place where the roof had fallen in. That one down there goes past Media Luna, and there's still another that runs the length of the place that, that's the longest. That may be the that may be the way I came. Where are you heading? Toward Sayula. Imagine, I thought Sayula was that way. I always wanted to go there. They say there's lots of people there, about like other places. Think of that, and us all alone here, dying to know even a, even a little life. Where did your husband go? He isn't my husband. He's my brother, though he doesn't want anyone to know. Where did he go? I took, I, I, I guess, to look for a stray calf that's been wandering around here. At least that's what he told me. How, how long have you two been here? Forever. We were born here. Then you must have known Dolores Preciado. Maybe he did. Donis, I know so little about people. I never go out. I, I've been right here for what seems forever. Well, maybe not that long, just since he made me his woman. Ever since then, I've been closed up because I'm afraid to be seen. He doesn't want to believe it, but it isn't true. I would give anyone a scare. He walked to stand in the sunlight. Look at my face. It was an ordinary face. What is it you want me to see? Don't you see my sin? Don't you see those purplish spots? Like in Pedigo, I'm covered with them. And that's only on the outside. Inside, I'm a sea of mud. But who's going to see you if there's no one here? I've been through the whole town and not seen anyone. You think you haven't, but there are still a few people around. Haven't you seen Filomeno or Dorotea or Melchides or old Prudencio? And aren't Sostenes and all of them still alive? What happens is they stay close to home. I don't know what they do by day, but I know they spend their nights locked up indoors. Nights around here are filled with ghosts. You should see all the spirits walking through the streets. As soon as it's dark, they begin to come out. No one likes to see them. There are so many of them and so few of us that we don't make the effort to pray for them anymore, to help them out of purgatory. We don't have enough prayers to go around. Maybe a few words of the Lord's prayer for each one, but that's not going to do them any good. Then there are our sins on top of theirs. 
none of us still living is God's grace. We can't lift up our eyes because they're filled with shame, and shame doesn't help. At least that's what the bishop said. He came through here some time ago giving confirmation, and I went to him and confessed everything. I can't pardon you, he said. I'm filled with shame. That isn't the answer. Marry us. Live apart. I tried to tell him that life had joined us together, herded us like animals, forced us on each other. We were so alone here, we were the only two left, and somehow the village had to have people again. Have, had to have people again. I told him now maybe there would be someone for him to confirm when we came back. Go your separate ways, there's no other way. But how will we live? Like anyone lives. And he rode off on his mule, his face hard without looking back as if he was leaving an image of damnation behind him. He's never come back, and that's why this place is swarming with spirits, hordes of restless souls who died without forgiveness, and people who would never have won forgiveness in any case, even less if they had to depend on us. He's coming. You hear? Yes, I hear. It's him. The door opened. Did you find the calf? She asked. It took it, it took it in its head not to come, but I followed its tracks, and I'll soon find where it is. Tonight I'll catch it. You're going to leave me alone tonight? I may have to, but I can't stand it. I need you here with me. That's the only time I feel comfortable, that time of night. But tonight I'm going after the calf. I just learned, I interrupted, that you two are brother and sister. You just learned that? I've known it a lot longer than you, so don't be sticking your nose into it. We don't like people talking about us. I only mentioned it to show I understand, that's all. Understand what? The woman went to stand beside him, leaning it against his shoulder, and repeated in turn, You understand what? Nothing, I said. I, I understood less by the minute, and added, All I want is to go back where I came from. I should use what little lights left of the day. You'd better wait, he told me. Wait till morning. It'll be dark soon and all the roads are grown over. You might get lost. I'll start you off in the right direction tomorrow. All right. Through the hole in the roof, I watched the thrushes, those birds that flock at dusk before the darkness seals their way. Then a few clouds already scattered by the wind that comes to carry off the day. Later the evening, stars came out. Then, still later, the moon. The man and woman were not around. They had gone through the patio, and by the time they returned, it was already dark, so they had no way of knowing what had happened while they were gone. And this is what happened. A woman came into the room from the street. She was ancient, so thin she looked as if, as if her hide had shrunk to her bones. She looked around the room with big, round eyes. She may even have seen me. Perhaps she thought I was sleeping. She went straight to the bed and pulled a leather trunk from underneath it. She searched through it. Then she clutched some sheets beneath her arm and tiptoed out as if not to wake me. I lay rigid, holding my breath, trying to look anywhere but at her. Finally, I worked up the courage to twist my head and look in her direction, toward the place where the evening star had converged on the moon. Drink this, I heard. I did not dare turn my head. Drink it. It will do you good. It's orange blossom tea. I know you're scared because you're trembling. This will ease your fright. I recognize the hands, and as I raise my eyes, I recognize the face. The man, who was standing beside her, asked, Do you feel sick? I don't know. I see things in people where you may not see anything. A woman was just here. You must have, you must have seen her leave. Come on, he said to his wife. Leave him alone. He talks like a mystic. We should, we should let him have the bed. Look how he's trembling. He, he must have a fever. Don't pay him any mind. People like him work themselves into a state to get attention. I knew, I knew one over the Media Luna who called himself a divine. What he never divined was that he was going to die as soon as the patron divined. What a bungler he was. This is just, this one's just like him. They spend their lives going from town to town to see what the good Lord has to offer, but he'll not find anyone here to give him so much as a bite to eat. You see how he stopped trembling? He hears what we're saying. It was as if time had turned backward. Once again, I saw the star nestling close to the moon, scattering clouds, flocks of thrushes, and suddenly bright afternoon light. 
Walls were reflecting the afternoon sun. My footsteps sounded on the cobblestones. The burrow driver was saying, Look up Doña Edjevigis, if she's still alive. Then a dark room, a woman snoring by my side. I noticed that her breathing was uneven as if she were dreaming or as if she were awake and merely imitating the sounds of sleep. The cot was a platform of reeds covered by gunny sacks that smelled of piss as if they'd never been aired in the sun. The pillow was a saddle pad wrapped around a log or a roll of wool so hard and sweaty it felt as solid as a rock. I could feel a woman's naked legs against my knee and her breath upon my face. I sat up in the bed supporting myself on the adobe hard pillow. You're not asleep? she asked. I'm not sleepy. I slept all day long. Where's your brother? He went off somewhere. You heard him say where he had to go. He may not come back tonight. So he went away in spite of what you wanted? Yes, and he may never come back. That's how they all do. I have to go down there. I have to go out that way until they've gone so far that it's easier not to come back. He's been trying and trying to leave, and I think this is the time. Maybe, though he didn't say so, he left me here for you to take care of. He saw his chance. The business of the stray was just an excuse. You'll see. He's not coming back. I wanted to say, I feel dizzy. I'm going to get out to get a little air. Instead, I said, don't worry, he'll be back. When I got out of bed, she said, I left something for you on the coals in the kitchen. It's not very much, but it will at least keep you from starving. I found a piece of dried beef and a few warm tortillas. That's all I could get, I heard her saying from the other room. I traded my sister's two clean sheets I've, I've had since my mother died. I kept them under the bed. She must have come to get them. I didn't want to tell you in front of Donis, but she was the woman you saw, the one who gave you such a scare. A black sky filled with stars, and beside the moon, the largest star of all. Don't you hear me? I asked in a low voice, and her voice replied, Where are you? I'm here in your village with your people. Don't you see me? No, son, I don't see you. Her voice seemed all-encompassing and faded into distant space. I don't see you. I went back to the room where the woman was sleeping and told her, I'll stay over here in my own corner. After all, the bed's as hard as the floor. If anything happens, let me know. Donis won't be back, she said. I saw, it in, I saw it in his eyes. He was waiting for someone to come so he could go away. Now you'll be the one to look after me, won't you? Don't you want to take care of me? Come sleep here by my side. I'm fine where I am. You'd better, you'd be better off up here in the bed. The ticks will eat you alive down there. I got up and crawled in bed with her. The heat woke me just before midnight and the sweat. The woman's body was made of earth, layered in crusts of earth. It was crumbling, melting into a pool of mud. I felt myself swimming in the sweat, streaming from her body, and I couldn't get enough air to breathe. I got out of bed. She was sleeping. From her mouth bubbled a sound very like a death rattle. I went outside for air, but I could not escape the heat that followed wherever I went. There was no air, only the dead still night fired by the dog days of August. Not a breath. I had to suck in the same air I exhaled, cupping it in my hands before it escaped. I felt in, in and out less each time until it was so thin it slipped through my fingers forever. I mean forever. I have a memory of having seen something like foamy clouds swirling above my head and then being washed by the foam and sinking into the thick clouds. That was the last thing I saw. Are you trying to make me believe you drowned, Juan Preciado? I found you in the town plaza far from Donis's house, and he was there too, telling me you were playing dead. Between us, we dragged you into the shadow of the arches, already stiff as a board and all drawn up like a person who died of fright. If there hadn't been any air to breathe that night you, you're talking about, we wouldn't have had the strength to carry you, even less bury you. And as you see, bury you we did. You're right, Doroteo. You say your name's Doroteo? It doesn't matter. It's really Doroteo, but it doesn't matter. It's true, Doroteo. The murmuring killed me. 
There you find the place I love most in the world, the place where I grew thin from dreaming, my village rising from the plain, shaded with trees and leaves like a piggy bank filled with memories. You'll see why a person would want to live there forever, dawn, morning, midday, night, always the same, except for the changes in the air. The air changes the color of things there, and life whirs by as quiet as a murmur, the pure murmurings of life. Yes, Dorotea, the morning, the murmuring killed me. I was trying to hold back my fear, but it kept building until I couldn't contain it any longer. And when I was face to face with the murmuring, the dam burst. I went to the plaza. You're right about that. I was drawn there by the sound of people. I thought there really were people. I wasn't in my right mind by then. I remember I got there feeling my way along the walls as if I were walking with my hands and the walls seemed to distill the voices. They seemed to be filtering through the cracks and crumbling mortar. I heard them, human voices, not clear but secretive voices that seemed to be whispering something to me as I passed, like a buzzing in my ears. I moved away from the walls and continued down the middle of the street, but I still heard them. They seemed to be keeping pace with me ahead of me, or just behind me. Like I told you, I, I wasn't hot anymore, just the opposite. I was cold. From the time I felt the house, from the time I left the house of that woman who let me use her bed, the one I told you I'd been dissolving in the liquid of her sweat, from that time on I felt cold, and the farther I walked, the colder I got, until my skin was all goosebumps. I wanted to turn back. I thought that if I went back, I might find the warmth I'd left behind. But I realized after I walked a bit farther that the cold was coming from me, from my own blood. Then I realized I was afraid. I heard all the noise in the plaza and I thought I'd find people there to help me get over my fear. That's how you came to find me in the plaza. So Donus came back after all? The woman was sure she'd never see him again. It was morning by the time we found you. I don't know where he came from. I, I didn't ask. Well, anyway, I reached the plaza. I leaned against a pillar of the arcade. I saw that no one was there, even though I could still hear the murmuring of voices like a crowd on market day, a steady sound with no words to it, like the sound of the wind through the branches of a tree at night when you can't see the tree or the branches, but you hear the whispering like that. I couldn't take another step. I began to sense the whispering drawing nearer, circling around me a constant buzzing like a swarm of bees until finally I could hear the almost soundless words, pray for us. I could hear that's what they were saying to me. At that moment, my soul turned to ice. That's where, that's why you found me dead. You'd have done better to stay home. Why did you come here? I told you that at the very beginning, I came to find Pedro Peramo, who they say was my father. Hope brought me here. Hope? You pay dear for that. My illusions made me live longer than I should have, and that was the price I paid to find my son, who, in a manner of speaking, was just one more illusion, because I never had a son. Now that I'm dead, I've had time to think and understand. God never gave me so much as a nest to shelter my baby in, only an endless lifetime of dragging myself from pillar to post, sad eyes casting sidelong glances, always looking past people, suspicious that this one or that one had hidden my baby from me, and it was all the fault of one bad dream. I had two. One of them I called the good dream and the other the bad dream. The first one that, the first one that made me dream I had a son to begin with. And as long as I lived, I always believed it was true. I could feel him in my arms, my sweet baby, with his little mouth and eyes and hands. For a long, long time, I could feel his eyelids and the beating of his heart on my fingertips. Why wouldn't I think it was true? I carried him with me everywhere I went, wrapped in my rebozo. And then one day, I lost him. In heaven, they told me they'd made a mistake, that they'd given me a mother's heart but the womb of a whore. That was the other dream I had. I went up to heaven and peeked in to see whether I could recognize my son's face among the angels. Nothing. The faces were all the same, all made from the same mold. Then I asked. One of those saints came over to me and, without a word, sank his hand into my stomach like he would have poked into a ball of wax. When he pulled out his hand, he showed me something that looked like a nutshell. This proves what I'm demonstrating to you. You know how strange they talk up there, but... 
You can understand what they're saying. I wanted to tell them that it was just my stomach all dried up from hunger and nothing to eat. But another one of those saints took me by the shoulders and pushed me to the door. Go rest a while more on earth, my daughter, and try to be good so that your time in purgatory will be shortened. That was my bad dream and the one where I learned I never had a son. I and that, my friends, is the end of Pedro Paramo by Juan Rufo here at Carla Reads the Classics. Thank you so much for listening. And please tune in tomorrow for part two and the finale of Pedro Paramo. As always, if you have questions, comments, or if you'd like to make a suggestion, please write to me at carlettreadstheclassics at gmail.com. And also remember, you can interact with the Q&A after the episode description of each episode. And I would also ask you to please rate this podcast, whether you find it a one, five, or anywhere in between. Please do give it a rating. And I'll see you tomorrow here at Carlett Reads the Classics.